Arguably the most common diabetic medication for type 2 diabetics is the biguanides, which is most commonly metformin, or glucophage, or, or extended release glucophage. This should be taken with meals. If it's dosed twice a day, it can be taken with a morning or an, and an evening meal, or if once a day, with lunch. The way these work are they decrease sugar made by the liver and decrease the amount of sugar sent into your bloodstream. They also decrease insulin resistance. Sulfonylureas are the next most common type of type 2 diabetic medications. These include Amaryl, Glucotrol, Diabeta, or Diabenese. These work by stimulating your pancreas to create more insulin. And this differs because it's a more proactive medication in taking the insulin your body produces and increasing its efficiency. Thiazolidine diones are the next class of medications. These are limited to Avandia and Actos. These are insulin sensitizing medications which differ from the biguanides and the sulfonylureas. These help your body decrease insulin resistance so the insulin your body already produces can be used more efficiently. In recent years, there's been a black box warning for patients with congestive heart failure. So anyone with cardiovascular issues should not be prescribed this medication. The next class of medications, meglitonides, include Starlex and Prandin. These work by stimulating the pancreas to make more insulin after meals. These typically work faster than sulfonylureas and are typically more commonly used. The next class, alpha-glucosidase inhibitors, slows the digestion and absorption of starches. So as you eat complex sugars from food, it inhibits this absorption in, in order to control blood glucose levels throughout the day. The next class of medications is right now limited to Genuvia, called dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitors. A couple of medications are now being worked on in this class of medications, but right now Genuvia is the only option. These are relatively unique in their mechanism. They increase insulin production and release, similar to sulfonylureas, but they also decrease glucagon secretion from pancreas. And glucagon is the opposite of insulin. This hormone draws glucose from the cells back into the bloodstream, as opposed to insulin, which does the opposite. Several of these medications, particularly glebaride and metformin, are available as combinations. Most diabetics will have to be on more than one medication. So these combinations are available generically and reduce the pill burden for patients. So instead of taking three or two medications during the day, they can combine into one convenient dose. Other medications included in managing type 2 diabetes are these non-insulin injectables. Bieta, which is in Cretan mimetic, is a synthetic analog of a naturally occurring hormone. This medication helps reduce glucose ingested and locks it into the cells. Similin, which is another analog of a naturally occurring hormone, is used commonly with insulin. It's recommended for type 1 and type 2 diabetics, and this works through several mechanisms. First, usually slowing gastric emptying, suppression of glucagon secretion, and regulates appetite function. Lastly is insulin. Insulin is always used in type 1 diabetics, and less commonly in type 2 if not controlled on the oral medications. There are four types of insulin available. Rapid acting, which is Novolog, Humalog, and Epidra. Short acting, which is Humalin R and Novolin R. Intermediate acting, Humalin N and Novolin N and longer acting, Lantis and Levomir. There are also combinations available as mixes. These are most commonly regular and MPH, which is commonly dosed together to help manage diabetics' blood glucose, as well as an MPH and rapid acting. Rapid actings are usually dosed before meals, and long actings are usually done at bedtime to control overnight glucose. It is important for your health to control your blood glucose or your blood sugar. Keeping your blood glucose close to normal helps prevent or delay some diabetic problems. Some of these complications include eye disease, kidney disease, heart disease, and nerve damage. You can help control your gl glucose levels by keeping track of it in two ways. You can test your own glucose two to four times each day, and this is called self-monitoring your blood glucose. And this is like taking a Polaroid picture of your glucose. It tells you exactly what your sugar levels are at that exact time. But because your sugar levels fluctuate, we recommend getting a hemoglobin A1C test every three months. And this is more like a movie. It tells you what your sugar levels have been for the last three months. Diabetic nerve damage. 
also called diabetic neuropathy, occurs when there is high blood glucose levels, and glucose damages the nerve's coating. This is like taking sandpapers to the coating of the nerves. Controlling your blood glucose can prevent or delay some of those complications associated with diabetes, such as diabetic neuropathy, and it can also reduce the pain from diabetic neuropathy if you already have it. Some signs of diabetic nerve damage is pain, burning, tingling, or loss of feeling in the feet and hands. You can also have abnormal sweating. You can feel lightheaded when you stand up. You might find difficulty swallowing and keeping food down, and also difficulty urinating. You might also find impotence, which is an inability to get an erection. Since we have nerve damage, and poor circulation in diabetes, and we are more prone for infections, we can have serious foot problems. It is important to prevent foot problems by checking feet every day, having proper care of toenails, protecting our feet from heat and cold, and by being physically active, and this increases our circulation to our feet. Because of high blood glucose, people with diabetes also are more likely to get um, dental disease. And this includes sore, swollen, and red gums that bleed when you brush your teeth. People with diabetes should take extra care to keep up to date with vaccinations and immunizations. There are several vaccines we recommend getting. You should get your flu vaccine every year between mid-October and November. Also, pneumococcal vaccine every five years. You should also get your tetanus and diphtheria toxoid every 10 years because of the increase in foot infections.